All right. Welcome, everyone. This is Peter Smallridge. I'm happy to welcome you to the December 16, 2020 webinar, Forest Connect webinar. I'm the host. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and we're joined today by Christy Sullivan. Christy's a friend and colleague from the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. We've changed our department name, so DNRE, Department of Natural Resources and Environment. Anyway, Christy is going to be talking about pollinators in the woods, which apparently is a very interesting topic to a lot of you. We had uh, 620 people registered as of 1130, and we have I'll say the highest noon attendance thus far at 314. So no pressure, Christy. I'm turning it over to you. I'm going to all mute right. my microphone. I'm going to mute my microphone, and it's all yours. Thanks for joining us. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm thrilled that all of you are joining us today. It's uh, it's an exciting topic for me, and one that's kind of new to me. One I've just started to explore. Uh, I got in, in um, became interested because I, uh, some of you may know, I've been involved with some research uh, looking at forest management and leaving how much residual wood you should leave behind and the benefits uh, to soils and to things like salamanders and um, seedling regeneration. And um, as part of that, uh, I realized that, that pollinators are really um, important group of organisms that might also benefit from leaving woody material behind. And so looking to incorporate that into some research coming up this next summer. So uh, an intern and I did a, a pretty extensive literature review this summer and found that there's a lot of good information um, that I think is going to be useful um, for forest landowners. Um, but there's also a lot still yet to be learned, or a lot that's unknown. Um, another thing that interested me is that um, years ago, I was at a meeting, a Northeast Regional meeting, where somebody from the Forest Service was talking about uh, black cherry regeneration and difficulty um, that they're having regenerating black cherry in, in Pennsylvania and some of the potential causes. And one of the causes that, that they are exploring is the possibility that the uh, black cherries aren't being pollinated the way they have in the past. They're, they're not getting pollinated frequently enough. Um, so with that, I kind of dove into this topic and um, I'm really excited to, to share it with you. So today we're going to talk about uh, pollinators in the woods and understanding and creating forest pollinator habitat. So what or who are the pollinators? Uh, pollinators are beetles and flies, bees, moths and butterflies, ants, bats and birds. That pretty much covers it for, um, for the northern, for North America. Uh, today we're really going to focus on beetles, flies, bees, moths, and butterflies. I'm not going to refer to ants, birds, and bats. Um, and uh, within that, bees and moths and butterflies are the most well-known group. Bees are probably the most efficient pollinators. Uh, I won't be talking much about beetles and maybe just a little bit about flies because less is known about them and, and their needs. But I will, I do want to note that a lot of the pollinators that we see when we look um, in our gardens or in our yards and we see um, organisms that are, are pollinating our flowers, a lot of the flies actually look like bees. They mimic them in coloration. And so I wanted to point out the picture here at the top left of uh, something that looks a little bit like a bee, but it's actually a fly and um, point out the difference between bees and flies. If you look at this fly, you can see one set of wings and then barely below the wing that's to the right of the screen, you can see a little stem with a knob on the top. And those knobs are called um, haltiers and they're like a vestigial wing. So there used to be two sets of wings in flies but they no longer have them. Um, and so that's the way you can tell the difference because bees still have two full pairs of wings. So if you wanna know the difference between a bee and a fly when it's on your flowers, uh, that's the way to do it. So what is pollination? Well, pollination occurs when pollen is moved within a flower or among flowers. And it's the transfer of pollen between um, flowers of the same species that fertilizes the flower and results in successful seed and fruit production. So you can see in the bottom uh, left-hand corner in that diagram, you see a bee or any kind of pollinator goes into the flower. 
to get nectar, goes to the base of the pistil um, in the process, brushes by those little stems with the knobs that are the stamens, um, collects the pollen on their bodies. Often bees are often fuzzy and, um, and the pollen will stick to them and then flies to the next flower where um, it will touch, uh, the pollen can fall onto the stigma uh, there at the top and then um, will fertilize the eggs. So, um, and on the right hand there, you can see the, the bee with um, kind of a pollen pouch. So you can see some bees have those pouches and, and you can actually see all that pollen filled in the pouch. So um, pollinators are super important. They're required for the reproduction of over 85% of the world's flowering plants. And that includes two thirds or more than two thirds of the world's crop species. In the US alone, we have over 100 crop species that need or benefit from insect pollinators. Um, and that's a value of 15 billion annually for agriculture, over 11 billion of which can be attributed to, to honeybees alone. And we'll talk about honeybees a little bit here. Um, pollinators are also really important because they, um, in natural habitats, because uh, flowers, shrubs, and trees of fields and forests require pollination, and also the fruit, fruit and seeds that result from insect pollination are a major part of the diet of about 25% of all birds and of mammals ranging from red bag voles to black bears. So a lot of organisms depend on the food that's produced as a result of pollination. Um, honeybees are um, you know, probably the bees that we're most familiar with, but honeybees are not native. They were introduced and they're managed to provide pollination services and to, to produce honey. So you can kind of think of them as an agricultural animal in and of themselves, like a cows or goats or, or any other kind of um, species that we manage for agricultural purposes. <clears throat> In 2006, uh, some beekeepers in the US noticed unusually high overwinter mortality of honeybee colonies. And this phenomenon became known as colony collapse disorder. And a lot of you probably saw um, information about that um, in the news and, and in various publications. There was a lot, um, uh, it was all a buzz about honeybee decline. For um, so looking at this graph here, it shows the percentage of honeybee colonies that were lost each winter in the United States. You can see starting in 2006, um, honeybee mortality went up, well, the, the total percent of colonies lost went up to 31% and stayed pretty high um, for many years. The last year uh, pictured here is 2016 and 17, still fairly high, although it had come down a bit. And I was unable to find anything for the last few years. Uh, but it still continues to be an issue. The reasons for honeybee decline uh, are, are many, and it may be like a synergistic effect where there are a lot of different um, pressures on these uh, colonies that are causing them to, um, to not make it. So there are, like any managed species, when you only have one species or just a couple of species, you know, it, they're, they'll be prone to pathogens and parasites, and that's one of the main things that was happening with honeybees, uh, the, the varroa mite uh, was causing um, death of, of the bees um, and other pathogens were uh, spread by the varroa mites that were causing mortality. And then there are also a lot of different environmental factors. So just overall, a loss of genetic diversity within the populations that were being managed um, and also um, things like ch climate change. So. Um, with climate change, uh, what we're seeing is that there's this um, asynchronicity, they, they call it. So it's a, um, a mismatch between the timing of flowering and the timing of insect emergence um, for the pollinators that pollinate those species. So for example, if say a tree flowers in, in response to daylight hours and a bee emerges in response to temperature, you could see that um, the, there may be a mismatch. So maybe if it's a hot year, the bees may come out early, but the flowers haven't bloomed yet, um, et cetera. And there are many different um, variables that can affect that, but, um, and each species is different, but that can be an issue. Also increased humidity and cold can be an issue for, for bees. 
as can drought. And uh, lastly, uh, habitat loss. So not having enough flowering plants on our landscape, um, managing a little too intensively, you know, cleaning things up, not leaving natural habitats uh, behind can um, really reduce the number of flowering plants that we have on the landscape. And those flowering plants are very important for bees to find food. So in addition to honeybee declines, uh, native pollinator populations have been declining as well. Uh, bumblebees, for example, we all have heard about monarch butterflies and, and their precipitous decline, and other butterflies have been declining as well. Uh, there's far less known about the state of native pollinator populations overall, so we don't have a lot of baseline information for a lot of these species, and so it's hard to know if they're, if they're in decline or what the state of their populations is. But uh, we do know that boosting populations of native pollinators can help offset the loss of honeybees and their pollination services. So we can use native pollinators as a substitute, a natural substitute for uh, the loss of those honeybee colonies. And more and more people are um, looking at the effects and the benefits to agriculture of trying to boost populations of native pollinators uh, near in and adjacent to our crop fields. Some of the causes for, that have been identified for native pollinator population declines are things like habitat fragmentation. So breaking large areas of habitat into smaller and smaller pieces, um, climate change, which I also mentioned for the honeybee populations, um, introduction of non-native plants. So um, uh, like a lot of animals, a lot of organisms, they tend to do better uh, with the plants that they evolved with, so with native plants. And um, when invasive species take over, then there are fewer native plants. Um, pathogens that can affect native pollinator populations as well. And um, actually honeybees, when they get pathogens, they, some of those pathogens can be transferred to our native species. Overgrazing by white-tailed deer. So deer, as many of you know, have a serious effect on the diversity and abundance of our flowering plants in our forests and also the diversity of tree and shrub species that we can grow there. And so um, overgrazing by white-tailed deer can um, affect pollinators in that way by reducing the, the amount and diversity of native flowering plants. Um, pesticides, so pesticides can have a serious effect on population or pollinator populations, um, harvesting or over-harvesting of wild native plants. And then finally, the loss of open forests and forest clearings. And we'll talk about why that is in, in a little bit. So in New York State overall, um, we have 450 wild pollinator species, and they're important to our commercial crops as well as our natural ecosystems. So there are some benefits. So, so keeping hedgerows and managing nearby forests and natural areas can improve population natural habitats as well as in agricultural fields and even in your home. So if you have woods or natural areas near your open habitats, um, you can think of them as a source population for uh, the, the habitats where you're growing your plants. The source population for pollinators, that is. So some of the research that's been done that I found really fascinating, um, and I, I have some of the papers, the research papers, I, I've listed their authors in the year in case you're interested in looking for the paper, these specific papers. But um, one particular research study looked at soybean crops and how they might benefit from forest pollinators. So soybeans are not, they don't require pollinators um, to produce the beans. They're wind pollinated, I believe. Uh, but in this, in this study, they found that the closer the soybeans were to a forest, the higher the visitation rates to soybean flowers um, by native pollinators. So there were pollinators visiting um, along the edges of the forest and in a little bit. Um, and that greater pollination, pollinator presence led to an increase in soybean yield. Uh, the smaller bees especially uh, dropped off after a shorter distance from the forest, which is uh, whereas the larger bees could fly a little bit further into the field. So that really um, kind of leads us to think about uh, proximity of the forest to the entire field and that that forest is, was serving as a source population of pollinators. 
In another study, um, they found with soybeans a six to 18% increase in yield of soybeans when there were uh, forests nearby um, that provided uh, habitat for those native pollinators. So even though um, they don't, soybeans don't require pollinators to produce soybeans, the visitation increased the amount of pollination that was occurring and resulted in higher yields. And there are other studies that have shown similar things for other, um, other products like strawberries, for example. And uh, Brian Danforth and um, his group, uh, Cass Urban Mead is a, she's a PhD student in entomology here at Cornell. She's been uh, also looking at uh, native pollinators and pollination in apple orchards and the benefits of um, enhancing habitat for native pollinators both in and near those orchards and finding that pollination increases um, pretty dramatically. Um, another benefit of, of focusing on native pollinators is that they tend to be more efficient pollinators than honeybees and they can effectively pollinate flowers with fewer pollinator visits. They do something called buzz pollination where they actually create a vibration that can bring poll pollen up from deeper within the flower. And uh, because of that, they're uh, more effective. There are um, native fly and bee species like our mason bees and our bumblebees that also can tolerate colder, wetter conditions than honeybees. So if we have a particularly wet and cool spring, then those bees can kind of substitute for honeybees because um, they are just more tolerant of those, those harsher conditions. A diversity of species overall creates a more stable pollinator network. So the more different species you have and the more different uh, environmental conditions that they can tolerate, uh, the more different types of flowers that they visit, uh, then the more stable um, our pollinator network is. So um, some species of pollinators are forest specialists. Uh, so why manage pollinators in your forest? Some are forest specialists and they require forest um, and forest habitat. And then others are more generalist species. They move between forest and agricultural fields and other land use types. So focusing on the forest is good for forest habitat and also for adjacent habitat. Pollinators can ensure forest plant diversity within your forest. So some of the insect pollinated trees and shrubs that we have in our Northeastern forests are things like red maple, horse chestnut, hawthorns, um, apples, basswood, berries, black locust, willows, tulip tree, service berry, American mountain ash, and Eastern redbud. So these are some of the species that do require insect pollination. And then some of our um, spring ephemerals like trout lily and trillium and hepatica, spring beauty, jack in the pulpit, wild geranium. So a whole squirrel corn, a whole, whole lot of different species are dependent on these pollinators. And early flowering forest plants are more likely to be insect pollinated. Um, their bloom time occurs before leaf out when the forests have more available sunlight. And that's when uh, a lot of the forest pollinators are more active, at least the the bees and um, moths and butterflies, um, the flies can be more active. Uh, they do better than bees do um, in cooler, more closed canopy forests. So pollinators are also an important food resource for many for forest organisms like birds, amphibians, other insects, and some mammals. Um, you know, I mentioned before that a lot of organisms, a lot of wildlife will feed on the plant products, uh, like berries and such that are produced by plants as a result of pollination, but they also will directly feed on those pollinators. And so the organisms themselves are a food source for wildlife. So some possible goals that you might have as a landowner for managing uh, forests for pollinators include things like um, maintaining the greatest number of pollinator species. Maybe you just want to um, benefit as many species as possible. You're looking for species diversity in your pollinators so that you can also have species diversity in your, your forest plant community. Um, you may want to see many different kinds of pollinators on your land. So maybe you are looking 
to um, promote habitat for the more charismatic species, so more lepidopterans like butterflies and, and moths. Uh, you may um, want to promote habitat for different types of pollinators just to support a wider variety of flowering plants, or you might want to maximize the amount of crop pollination provided by wild native pollinators. If you're um, a farmer, if you're growing uh, a large garden or even a small garden in, in and around your home, you may want to uh, focus on pollinator habitat management in the adjacent forest to enhance that. And, uh, or you may be looking to sustain a healthy population of, of an endangered pollinator population. And monarch butterfly is a really good example of that. Um, maybe not necessarily within your woods, could you manage for monarchs, but uh, maybe along the edge of your woodlands and, and we'll get into that a bit too. Because there are so many different types of pollinators and each has uh, different nesting and feeding needs and behaviors, there's no single management approach that can benefit every species of pollinator. But by being aware of what some of these needs are, you can look at what you have, what types of habitats you have on your property, what your options are, and what are some of the small scale and maybe bigger scale changes that you might be able to make to, um, to make a difference. So uh, to talk about that in a little more detail, I'm just gonna talk first about habitat structure. So what about the structure of your forest? What, what can you think of there or think about uh, to enhance populations? Well, bees and butterflies generally prefer open forest canopies with more light availability um, for a couple of reasons. One, bees tend to be more active and butterflies as well when it's again, warm and sunny. And um, so that gives them the opportunity to kind of bask in the sunshine and, and, um, and rest. And then also gives them enough um, ability to fly from place to place. The abundance of flowering and larval food plants um, also is greater in canopy gaps where the sunlight reaches the forest floor. You're going to have more food, more herbaceous plants, more, more shrubs growing, and flowering will be more abundant. Um, and it's generally uh, flowering and, and the abundance of plants is going to be higher in open versus closed forests as well. So not just in canopy gaps, but in forests that are more open. Um, I uh, found several papers, several research projects looking at uh, forest structure uh, via forest management um, and how that affected or affects pollinator populations. Um, one showed that five acre patch cuts with 30, 60, or 100% over story tree removal increase bee abundance. And the greater the removal, the higher the abundance and diversity of bees. Another one showed that the number of different kinds of moths following a shelter wood cut, about 15% removal, declined but recovered in about three years. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about what moths would feed on um, as caterpillars or larvae, they will be feeding on vegetation. And so when you remove um, trees, you're removing uh, some of the foliage that would be available to them as, as food. So you can see that there could be a, you might expect uh, for that reason, for there to be a decline. Um, however, in clear cut or group selection, um, where there was 80% removal of canopy trees, it, it took even longer time for the, those populations to recover. So, um, so that's something to consider. The, the more uh, foliage that's removed, the longer it'll take those moth populations to recover. But um, that's kind of the opposite of what bees uh, were, um, were looking for. So uh, bees and flower flies in another study were shown to increase in group selection cuts in response to increased raspberry, blackberry, and beneficial environmental factors. Again, warmer temperature, um, sunlight, bare soil available for nesting, those types of factors. So um, this just really illustrates that different groups are going to be uh, benefited by different management strategies, uh, but definitely having at least small openings um, can benefit some of the most effective pollinators. In terms of habitat structure, having some patchy exposed ground with ample sun exposure is also beneficial for those ground nesting bees, especially our, our, early, um, our early nesters or early active bees. Uh, 
uh, things like mason bees that also uh, need mud or uh, create little bricks to build um, build their their housing. And um, the only thing that may do better in in shaded conditions, and I don't know about beetles because to be honest, I didn't find much about beetles, and there may not be that much known, but uh, flies definitely do uh, well in shaded conditions or or better than, than bees and uh, lepidopterans would do. And I just put this picture of a red trillium in here because um, it's one species that's uh, pollinated by flies. They don't have a very pretty smell. If you get down and you, you smell them, um, it's kind of a putrid scent and that putrid scent attracts the flies that, uh, that pollinate them. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit. We talked about structure and now I'm going to cover uh, cover. So what about habitat um, in terms of cover for these species? So um, there have been studies that have shown that leaving aggregated piles of wood behind following timber harvest can benefit pollinators. Um, things like cavity nesting bees, like honeybees and bumblebees uh, can nest in existing holes rather than building their own. So um, there, and also in the little cracks and crevices uh, or decaying wood. Uh, so sweat bees, for example, like to, um, they'll burrow into decaying wood. And uh, the small animal burrows that are created under piles. Uh, so say uh, uh, moles, for example, might create sm small mammal burrows and those burrows can be used and provide homes for some uh, bee species as well. Um, cover can also come in the form of standing dead wood. A lot of um, species can use standing dead wood. So honeybees again and bumblebees would be spe some, just some of the uh, many species that can use standing snags in the forest. In addition to cover, food is very, very, very important. Um, bees have to collect enough pollen and nectar to support both themselves and their offspring. So flowering plants are very, very important for bees. Um, most butterfly and moth larvae, however, feed on leaves. So um, having a lot of foliage and a diversity of foliage is um, important for those species. Woody plants are uh, more important to those species than even flowering herbaceous plants. Uh, they support about 10 times more butterfly and moth species than herbaceous plants do. And um, lepidopterans use native woody species as a source of, uh, of not only food, but also shelter for their larvae, for pupation, and then as a nectar source for adults uh, when, um, when they're feeding. And not, not all adult lepidopterans feed as adults. So for example, this is a luna moth, and I put a picture of a luna moth caterpillar there, their forest. There's, um, they'll eat a wide variety of different species, but um, they have local preferences for just a few they've found. So just a few different species um, can be critical for, the, for them. Um, and then as adults, uh, luna moths don't, uh, they don't feed at all. Okay, um, the best forest for pollinator habitat may have many herbaceous plants and a diversity of, of tree and shrub species. Um, one interesting thing, I was in a meeting yesterday with, uh, with Cass Urban Mead, who's the uh, PhD student in entomology here, and she said that um, as part of her work with uh, pollinators in orchards, she was um, looking at their gut contents to see what type of pollen they were feeding on. And she found that um, a lot of them had, for example, sugar maple pollen in their guts. And she's also seen them, uh, a lot of pollinators on oak trees and other types of trees that don't require pollination. And yet the pollen from those species, it's looking like is very, very important food for the pollinators and possibly for those pollinators who are visiting our agricultural areas. So having um, a variety of species of trees and shrubs um, kind of has a, the reverse effect. It provides food kind of like a, the buffet, the salad bar for pollinators. Uh, some pollinators are, are um, generalists and will eat all kinds of things, and some pollinators are very uh, much diet specialists, so will only feed on a few things. And the one that comes to mind that I think we're most familiar with would be monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies uh, 
feed on milkweed and they require milkweed uh, for their caterpillars. Um, so by providing plants that, pro uh, that bloom at different times throughout the year, you can provide food throughout the different seasons and therefore provide um, food throughout the seasons and um, for a variety of different species. Another thing to keep in mind um, is that invasive species, um, invasive plants, as I mentioned very briefly before, um, pollinators, native pollinators don't tend to prefer those and they can actually be uh, very harmful. So when you have more invasive plants, you tend to have fewer pollinators. Uh, so if you wanted to uh, replace native plants um, that with natives, then, or they, I'm sorry, they tend to replace native plants to inform monocultures of the, the invasive species. And some of them can be deadly. This is a picture of swallowwort. So swallowwort kind of tricks um, monarchs into thinking that it's milkweed and that it's okay and uh, they feed on, on the, uh, the plant, but it's actually toxic to them. So it's a, it's a dead end for, for monarchs. So to, um, to benefit pollinators, you wanna uh, remove or control invasive species when possible. So uh, removal of invasive privet and buckthorn, honeysuckle and other, uh, other plants can benefit native species. And uh, there's a study that showed that bee and butterfly populations can rebound in um, as little as two years following invasive species removal. So it really can have a, a difference and the difference that's noticeable within a very short time period. Okay, in addition to um, managing your forest directly, you can uh, think about habitats um, that are kind of part of your over overall forest or um, elements of it and concentrate on those too and ways that you can enhance habitat. So roadsides, for example, forest roads um, are can be an important uh, provider of nectar if you uh, manage to uh, optimize the number of and, and the amount of um, flowering plants that are growing alongside. Um, also power line corridors or gas line corridors are another option for growing additional flowering plants within the context, the larger context of your forest. Even in dense forests, um, creating pollinator habitat by managing the roads can be, can be beneficial. So if you have a closed canopy, like pictured on the left here, um, we have a lot of those types of roads at, at our Are Not Teaching and Research Forest. And along those roads, we have a lot of spring ephemerals growing. So it is more shaded conditions, but uh, we have an abundance of, of spring ephemerals along some sections of the road. Um, in more open sections of road like that are uh, um, pictured to the right, those tend to um, be the places where we have the later flowering plants. So it might be um, more things like goldenrod and asters and whatnot, where there's more sunlight reaching. So you can allow strips of grass and wildflowers to grow between the forest edge and the road um, to create food and cover and also a travel corridor for uh, for things like butterflies and moss. Um, you may consider uh, mowing in the early spring after the spring ephemerals bloom, but before the others have started to, to grow significantly. I've seen um, contradictory information. Maybe both of them are fine. And maybe some of you have some input as well, but I've seen um, other advice saying to mow in late fall after everything has bloomed. I think mowing in late fall the one detriment will be that um, some insects, not necessarily pollinators, but some insects also overwinter in the stems of some of those plants like goldenrod. And so mowing in late fall would eliminate that as habitat for other insects over winter. Um, but I think probably either would be fine, but you wanna avoid mowing often. So um, you wanna mow just, just enough to um, keep other things at bay, other plants that you, you may not want from taking over, maybe uh, more woody plants, um, but you uh, don't want to mow too often. If forest edges are another habitat that you can consider, uh, forest edges provide the opportunity to manage um, for better and more habitat. So in the pictures um, shown in this slide, the bottom left shows what's called a feathered edge. 
whereas the bottom right shows an abrupt edge. So an abrupt edge is when you have trees and maybe some shrubs or understory trees, but they, they stop very abruptly at the edge and there's not a lot of uh, gradual habitat. There's not a lot of natural vegetation um, after that. It's right to those trees and then the agricultural field. So um, by creating a feathered edge, uh, you can leave a section of unmowed or unplowed grassy and, and wildflower habitat before the forest edge, more of a, a gradual change in habitat. And, um, you, or you can thin trees for about 50 feet into your woods to create um, a feathered edge. So just not, uh, not removing too many, but remove enough that you're opening up the, the allowing sunlight in and maybe having more flowering plants along the edge and that can enhance um, pollinator habitat there. Um, in places where there are uh, feathered edges, you can increase bumblebee abundance, the total number of pollinator species overall, and the abundance of butterfly habitat specialists. So um, just to show there, the bottom right is a picture of a monarch Butterfly caterpillar monarchs require milkweed and you can often get milkweed growing along these forest edges. Um, another opportunity I think for managing forest pollinators is on log landing. So when you have a timber harvest and you have a landing, um, I think it's a great opportunity um, to provide pollinator habitat. And it's something I'd like to maybe look at more. Um, it provides the opportunity to, to reseed maybe with some perennial wildflower mixes that are suited to the, the, your specific, specific region. Maybe wildflower mixes that provide blooms during various times of the year. Um, you want to make sure you focus on native plants, plants that are um, developed for that region. And maybe also allow for some bare ground with loose soils that maybe persist along the edges. And that's not only for ground nesting bees that need, need the loose soil to uh, kind of burrow down to create their nests, um, but also having bare ground provides, again, that opportunity for mason bees to find mud to help build, build their, um, their nests. Um, we looked many years ago at the Arnott Forest at piling butt ends of logs along the edge of um, log landings following a timber harvest. And uh, we looked at it at, in terms of providing habitat for uh, forest reptiles actually, so for skinks and forest snakes, and found that uh, those log landings that had piles um, created wonderful habitat and had far more uh, forest reptiles than those log landings that didn't. But another benefit is that those logs um, are are very good for overwintering habitat for some butterflies um, and other species that overwinter tucked into the crevices of bark or in between the logs or underneath uh, things like the morning cloak butterfly, uh, which is pictured down below. Okay, so that's um, you know looking at the structure of your forest and some of the food and cover and uh, other types of habitat that are, are contained within your forested landscape. But uh, I just wanna kind of wrap things up today by talking about uh, some overall, some large scale habitat considerations and then some ways that you can actually create habitat. So some large scale habitat considerations for pollinators are things like um, preventing habitat fra fragmentation. So development of natural areas that breaks habitat into smaller and smaller pieces is, is not very beneficial to these organisms. Um, you can also focus on reducing deer populations when possible. So as I mentioned before, heavy browsing of plants by deer can reduce the number and uh, different types of flowers and plants available for pollinators. So um, you know, reducing deer populations is really critical. Um, you can minimize the use of pesticides and uh, also maybe focus on the timing of pesticide use. Um, Cass had an article in NIFOA magazine and uh, in that she recommended that if you're gonna do a basal bark spray or some sort of injection, you may wanna focus on doing those things um, post bloom time for the, the trees that you're targeting. So um, after those species have bloomed and um, that way you won't have 
individual organisms visiting those flowers during that season. And hopefully by the time the next season rolls around, the concentration will be very, very low in the flowering um, that occurs in the following season. And then be careful not to over harvest native wild plants in the forest. In terms of creating habitat, focus on creating small openings in the forest, small gaps that will allow sunlight to reach the forest floor and encourage the growth of flowering plants, um, encourage or support the growth of many different types of forest wildflowers, plants and trees, foster wildflower growth along roadsides, power line corridors, water features and on log landings, mow along roadsides in the fall after butterflies have completed their development, or I would say in the early spring after the spring ephemerals have um, bloomed and before everything else is starting to grow uh, profusely. And then leave brush or log piles or treetops on the ground after a timber harvest, or you can even create your own. If you, even if you don't have a timber harvest within your forest, you can thin a few trees and uh, create, a, create some piles of your own. So in summary, uh, pollinators are both a fascinating and important part of our ecosystems, and we still have a whole lot more to learn about them. Uh, bees, butterflies, and moths are the best known pollinators, but beetles and flies are also important, but there's less known about their habitat needs. And so hopefully we'll discover more as time goes on. While fields and gardens are the obvious habitats for pollinators, forests really are important too, and they can serve as a population source for nearby agricultural areas. And if you're interested in supporting a diverse a diversity of pollinators in your forest, whether big or small, uh, you can take some thoughtful action to benefit them. And the benefit to you is that you get to enjoy them. You get to enjoy the forest that um, is present as a result of them, and you also get to enjoy watching them and observing them um, for just your own enjoyment or for educational purposes, you know, bringing children out to the woods um, or adults to the woods to learn, to learn more about them. And I'm going to leave you with just a few, um, a few pollinator resources. There are a lot out there, so I just chose uh, a few that I think are, are really good and will represent a variety of different uh, viewpoints and um, suggestions. And um, with that, I'm uh, open for questions. Great job, Christy, thank you. That was very cool. So I've never, never looked into the variety of pollinators in the woods and it's really fun to think about I mean, you understand it kind of at a superficial level that there are pollinators, but that gives it a, a much deeper context. So thank you. Um, and there has been a very active chat box <laughs> during, okay. during the presentation. Um, and some of the questions are really far ranging. Do you want me to, and I can, If so how do you want to handle it? Do you want to scroll through the chat or do you want me to pull out questions and read them to you? What's what's going to be easiest for you? Um, I think if you if you pull them out, that would be really helpful. Um, would you like me to stop sharing the screen or or maybe leave um, so that they can copy? Leave, leave that up for a few minutes, but let okay. me, I'll just, I'll let people know that I'm going to create a blog. No, I'm trying to get my screen to roll up. Um, I'm going to create a blog on our Cornell Forest Connect Ning site, and I will put for sure that list of references that you have there. Other people had asked about some of the citations that you shared, so um, I'll work with Christy to, to um, embellish the blog site that I create, and I'll put things that Christy provides up there, um, okay. and I'll also put link to this archive once I post it on to um, on to YouTube. All right, scrolling, scrolling. There were I also, 400. Um, I also have a, we have a brand new fact sheet that we just finished on pollinators in your woods and I'll, um, I can send that to you too so that 
you can post it and I'll, when, when I stop sharing the screen here, I'll just share the screen to show the, the front page of that too. Perfect, thank you, thank you. All right, so we have scrolling back through all of the, uh, lots of snowshoe comments early on, there were 440 people that connected, so. Wow. I think Christy is gonna be at one point, so Christy's given lots of webinars over the years. Early on, she had several like uh, record number and she has just recaptured the record number. <laughs> It doesn't carry any prize well, or anything. Paul Catanzaro wasn't Paul. Didn't Paul beat me out? So I have to call him. He was trying. He, was <laughs> trying. he never. Paul gives really good webinars, but he never quite hit the. Okay, so there's there's several um, comments that people were offering. Uh, I think for the good of the order, I'm not going to go through those. I'll pull out questions. Um, so there's. A couple of questions have come up about the relative difference, differences or benefits or risk to pollinators when they're comparing native landscape plants to uh, native plants versus landscape plants. Had you did you come across any information about that, Christy? Um, you know, I I didn't. Um, I'm trying to think though. I guess I would say that, so do they mean landscape plants that would just be non-native or cultivars of, or was it more general? So there were a couple of different questions on that that I remember seeing. And there was somebody that shared a University of Vermont link that I think maybe addressed some of that. So I didn't know if there, it was just, so essentially it was a comparison of what happens to the pollinators on native plants versus other types of plants. So yeah. here's, um, a, here's a, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I, I think that overall what I've seen is that native plants um, are far more beneficial. Um, even some of our um, native plants though. Um, so so the, a, another cool thing is that bees use all kinds of products from, from the forest. It's not just sap. Um, they will feed on pollen, but they'll also use sap from different plants and trees to waterproof their nests. They use um, some, some products for, uh, for medicinal purposes um, and for antimicrobial purposes. So I think that probably those species, you know, native species would have more far-reaching benefits to them. Um, but in terms of, you know, there, there may be some cultivars or, you know, some landscape plants that are really good. Uh, but it seems to me that most of the species I see recommended for your, your home garden, your home flower gardens, um, that benefit bees and, and butterflies for that matter, are, um, are mostly native or near native. <laughs> Um, here's a question about conditions in a shaded woodland that would encourage mason bees. Hmm. Are there, do you know of any specific conditions? I'm, I'm assuming that this is, uh, they're wanting to create favorable habitat for mason bees. For mason bees. Um, so ma mason bees like, like cracks um, they're ground nesters, but they, um, so, and they need that, they need mud basically to, um, to build those little bricks and build these little combs where they, they wall off their eggs in little combs. So definitely some open area with uh, the availability of bare soils that would be adequate for making mud. I don't know exactly <laughs> how you would create that, but but they definitely need, need to have mud close by. Um, mason bees are the ones, you see those bee nesting structures that they sell these days with the tubes, so hollow tubes. Um, so uh, I don't know if it will be worth putting those up in the middle of the woods, but um, I think having, um, you know, wood piles and things like that. Even if you have a closed canopy forest, if you had some brush piles, that might 
might be helpful too. Anything where you know you can have cap natural small holes and cavities forming, and again that presence of mud. Okay. Um, there was a slide or two where you were talking about open forest and how that benefited um, pollinators. Can you characterize what you mean by open forest? Is it just openings in the canopy? Or does that also pertain to uh, mid layer and low canopy layers? So kind of like which strata are missing from the definition of open forest? Yes, that's a good point. Um, I think that vertical structural diversity, so having vegetation at various levels is important for pollinators the same way it might be for birds. You know, the more layers of vegetation you have, the more different species, the more foliage you have for things to feed on, um, the more, uh, you know, if there's, a, for, for that to form, you have to have an opening in the canopy. So I think, I think if I was to give one answer, it would be the four openings in the forest canopy that would actually encourage those other layers to grow. Okay. So things like gaps um, or you know group selection, that's that kind of thing. Okay. There was a here's a question about one of the slides where you were talking about patch, like five acre patch cuts with 30, 60, 100 percent removal, and then clear cuts and then shelter woods or three points. And there was a question and, and one of one of the points was about maybe one group of pollinators and another point was about moths and then the third point was about maybe something else. There seemed like some of them didn't quite match up. So is that a reflection of how different pollinators need different, maybe respond differently to different forest conditions? Or are there generalities that you should, you know, if, you're, if your singular focus is on pollinators, you should only do this or never do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, that makes perfect sense. No, I was really just highlighting a few papers that are out there and the, the fact that, um, yes, there's no one size fits all. Just like uh, if you wanted to manage for all birds, you couldn't do the same thing for all of them. So it's the same with pollinators. Um, they're very, you know, like moths and butterflies are very different organisms than, than bees, for example. So I think um, bees are gonna do better. And actually moths and butterflies do pretty well butterflies. Yeah, that's a good question. It would be, I see what, where you're going with that because um, moths and butterflies even need a lot of sunlight, adults for flight, not, well, not moths, but butterflies. Um, but then the moths did more poorly when you, um, when you opened up the canopy. Uh, and that, that makes sense in terms of, you know, when they lay eggs, they need foliage. And then those eggs hatch and they have their caterpillars, they need, you know, they need to feed on that foliage. So when you remove the foliage, you're going to have a decrease in the number of those, those organisms. Um, for a while, anyway, until the vegetation grows back. But for things like bees, you want to open up the canopy, allow light in that benefits them in terms of flight and being able to fly and feed and also encourages more flowering plants to grow on the forest floor. So, um, so I guess there is no one size fits all. And if you had a variety of conditions in your forest, that might you know, be the best way to encourage um, a lot of different um, species, or if you just think of it, even in, in at least one of those research papers, if you opened it up the canopy a bit um, and not a, a whole lot, then um, the moth population even recovered in a very short period of time, but you would have you know, had more open conditions for other organisms. Sure, okay. So I guess having a diverse landscape is a good thing for, yes. for pollinators as well as others, so. Did you come across any, so there's a question about if, if you came across any research related to kind of the large scale industrial forest management, they're mentioning particularly clear cutting and replanting and the use of herbicides. Is that any, any research on that impact on pollinators? Yes, 
Uh, I did not find anything specifically, no. But I did, so there's I did find something that was, uh, generally speaking, that more intensive land use. Uh, and I guess, you know, if, depending on how the forest was managed on a larger scale for in an industrial forest, it, if it was something that needed to be planted, um, that may be less beneficial to pollinators. Okay, so there's lots of I, I will, I mean, there's, this was a hugely engaged audience, which was really fun. It was, it was a little distracting because I was trying to both listen and watch. <laughs> um, but so I will save this uh, chat box um, and post that to the blog site that I create, just because there's a lot of links in here that people have shared and I want to make sure those are available. Um, Okay, so I'm just, um, so here's a question, um, any advice you can offer for ways to convince the people maintaining parks that they should create a small pollinator garden. They see it just as one more thing to maintain, but how to convince them that it's useful as a in a, in a both functional way as well as an educational way. Hmm. That is a very good question. Um... You know, maybe one approach that would be easier for the parks because, you know, rather than having something that needs to be more intensively managed by them with more input in terms of money and manpower would be to help them find some ways that they could enhance the existing natural habitat that they have. And uh, maybe even put up, you know, a few educational signs or have some sort of a, um, you know, an educational brochure or something. So maybe, in, in lieu of something that is constructed or contrived, um, helping them to, to work with what they already have to kind of make a difference and um, also minimize the, the manpower and other costs to them. Okay. Um, here's a question. If you can offer any advice on uh, how to make difficult management decisions for orchard and other agricultural systems that want or need to destroy diseased wood, but also want to leave wood for pollinator habitat? Um, could you repeat that? The first, sure. The so first there, part of that. So there, okay, so there are in, in orchards and other agricultural, I'll paraphrase it backwards a little bit, in, in orchards and other agricultural systems, um, sometimes they have diseased wood and they want or need to destroy that wood, I'm assuming because they're trying to reduce inoculum, um, but then it's a difficult management decision. So how do you kind of balance the, 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 the need or want to destroy the diseased wood, but also providing dead and decaying wood as pollinator habitat? So how do you, how do you are there other ways to, maybe other ways to get decaying wood that's not going to create an infection problem for an orchard but that would serve for pollinators or I don't I mean this is like that's one of the fun yeah. questions if you will, about like complexities of systems yes no that is a really good question I I don't know very much about pathogens um, you know which pathogens or, or what conditions um, really promote that for something like an orchard. So I, I can't really speak to that. Um, but I will say that um, that Cass Urban Mead, our, that PhD student, she, pro she may have some knowledge of that um, because she works with orchards and with native pollinators. And so I could, you know, if, if it's, I could try to pass it along to her. I could pass that question along. But I really, I just don't know enough um, 
to really feel like I could give any good advice. Okay. And I will, I'm not going to put you on the spot to answer this. Somebody wants to know if a uh, recommendation for a source of seed. And I'll just say that the chat window then lit up with lots of good suggestions. Oh, okay. So I'll refer people to the chat window if they want um, vendors. Okay, great. If um, Ernst Conservation Seed wasn't one of them, I would add that. Okay. That was, that was I think, the second one listed. So. Okay. Um, how large, so here's a question. How large of an impact is over harvesting of native wild plants on pollinators and which, which plants are being most reduced by har over harvesting? Huh. Um, that's a really good question too. And I, I don't, I don't really know. Um, I would, I would guess that that might vary by locality and what's what's available, what's present. Um, you know, orchids are always a big thing with uh, harvesting of native plants. Um, uh, ginseng might be if it's not harvested sustainably. Uh, so I don't I don't really know specifically, but I would just say that you know because some pollinators are very specific to certain plant species that. Um, over harvesting of any one particular species that might eliminate it from the forest or really reduce its abundance to something very, very minimal uh, could have a pretty severe effect on, on individual pollinators. But I can't, I'm not able to give any specific examples. Okay. Um, so there are a few questions that, and I'll see if, if you want to get into these or refer people to an internet search. So there's some questions that give, um, you know, they want to know about specific, or maybe where can you find, are, are there resources that have, um, that allow you to cross-reference a plant species and what insects, utilize, pollinators utilize that, and then conversely, um, which insects um, need which plants? So kind of like how do you how do you match up? So there's a question here about um, food for chickadees, and another question about pollinators for golden seal. So without kind of, I mean, you could you can imagine that would be a could be a very long conversation. Are there resources mm -hmm. available to help people find those matches of pollinators and plants? I I don't know of anything specifically. But if anybody does, I would love to, love to know what they are. <laughs> All right. So I've seen general, Doug Ptolemy, I think has done some, I've seen some references that, that he's, things that he's produced that get at some of that, but maybe mm -hmm. not in the city. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely, you know, some pollinators depending on um, the plant, the shape of the plant, uh, they're specific to the, those plants based on the shape and there are all kinds of things. And I think generally for, for the general groups, you know, like mason bees or carpenter bees or um, hoverflies, you know, they might, they might be somewhat specific to, to types, but I don't, I don't know anything about specifics. Okay, so actually here's a follow-up uh, for the golden seal question. Holocid bees, masked bees, and syrphid flies are some of the pollinators of golden seal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so lots of people saying what an awesome job you did. Thank you, everyone. Could you comment on the importance of oak to butterfly and whether red and white oaks are equally important and what butterfly species? Um, I, I don't, I actually don't know. Uh, I don't know about butterflies. The only, I mean, the only time yesterday was the first I learned that uh, pollinators, like bees mostly, maybe flies, but bees um, are using the pollen of some of those species like oaks that don't require uh, 
know, oaks and sugar maple, they don't require pollination by insects. Um, but, you know, according to what Cass said, you know, those uh, pollinators are still, they're using, they're feeding on that pollen. And uh, so it does have, you know, the benefit to the pollinators, even though it's not necessarily benefiting the plants. But I can also imagine that just like soybeans, if you maybe plants that don't require pollination by insects might still do better um, in terms of, um, you know, fruit and, and nut production, even though they don't require the pollinators if they do have pollination pollinator visits. But I don't know anything about butterflies and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how much nectar they produce, those flowers from those trees and butterflies otherwise would only feed on as caterpillars on the leaves of, of trees. So I don't, um, and I don't know any specifics in terms of which ones and which trees. Did I just get cut off? No. Hello. I... Hello? Okay, I'm here. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, all right, so here's a recommendation for a book by Doug Tallamy called Nature's Best Hope about native versus non-native plants. Okay, great. Okay. So lots more statements about what an awesome job you did. Uh, somebody here earlier, the statement about mason bees, this person says that plants with a pithy center, such as raspberry and sumac, are often used. Oh, right, good point. Yeah, because they can make those tubes, the hollow tubular things that um, are duplicated in those mason bee houses. comment about the fact that sometimes mature forests are used by some of these pollinators. So just to the to your point that one size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, question about um, ash trees, are there any pollinators that are going to suffer because of emerald ash borer and the mortality of ash? Um, you know, I wondered that myself. And uh, I don't I don't know any specifics, but I would guess that there would be. Um, I think Luna moths feed on ash. They do feed on other things still too. They're not specific to ash. But I would say anytime we lose a species that's fairly abundant on the landscape and native kind of wholesale, it's probably gonna affect the species that are you know, locally abundant and, and would feed on that. Or like the, like the luna moth that seems to develop local preferences based on availability, um, you know, I can see that that would, that would affect you know, species like that. Okay, so here's a question. Um, when somebody is going to establish pollinator habitat, is there a minimum acreage size that you should plant for it to be beneficial? I mean, kind of what's the, is there an, is there an entry level to make it worthwhile? Um, I don't know any specifics, but my gut says that um, it's, you know, whatever you can do based on what you have available to you. And, you know, I, I think of the one, um, one Elia bush that I have <laughs> in the spring and how completely covered with bumblebees it, it gets. And, and so I think even a very small patch can provide, you know, really good benefits on a, on a very local scale. Maybe if you, you know, the, the larger the area you had, maybe the more species you might benefit and the, you know, it might have a, a broader impact, but I think any little bit can help. Okay. All right, well, 
we are now down to half as many participants. We're down to 212, which is still an exceptional number. And you've done a great job with these questions, Christy. And the participants have been, this is really fun to see all of this interaction and sharing of information. So I want to thank Christy. I'm going to turn off the recording and thank you all. Wish everyone whatever holiday you celebrate. I hope you have a joyous, awesome holiday. And we'll see you all. Some of you, maybe you'll come back tonight for the 7 p.m. repeat performance. Um, if not, then we'll look for your participation in webinars in 2021. Thank you all. Thank you, Christy. Right. Great thank, job. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all for, 